Welcome you all for today's webinar. I request all the participants to kindly mute your mic for smooth conduction of the session. If you have any queries, you can post in the chat box. It will be addressed during the question and answer session. Participants are requested to join by using your full name. If not, kindly rejoin with us with your full name. Webinar will be starting soon. Thank you. You can start, Sazirega. On behalf of Mark Institute of Design and Architecture, Swarnamumi, we welcome you all for the MEDAS webinar series on Pro Process Over Product Investigative and Generative Design Systems by architect Thagbe Fatima, Director of Design Aware Studio. Now I request our beloved principal MEDAS, Professor Parisita Rajan, to deliver the welcome address. Please, sir. Thank you, sir. A very warm welcome to one and all. And a special welcome to our speaker, architect Fatima. Thanks for joining us to share on the topic process versus product. How oh, the process is very important to understand the product. And we know in today's world, people appreciate the product, they don't recognize the process. And uh, the process is the one which leads to the product. So only as a designer, we are the only people who know about it in depth of it. And also who knows how that process helped in creating the product with a lot of iterations and also a lot of other cross thinking, how best a product can come out. So this webinar is going to be an eye opener to all architects especially the young architects who are just to practice and also the bubbling students who want to get into practice, especially with a lot of challenges in the past one year time with the pandemic onset and also continuing the way it wants. So how this is going to help us in understanding the value of the product and uh, definitely our guest speaker is going to enlighten us on this particular thing. So once again, I welcome uh, our guest speaker and all the participants who all have joined us on this webinar. Happy learning. Enjoy learning. Thank you, sir. Now I request our architect Jabin to introduce the speaker. Please, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Takbi Fatima is an architect, educator, and entrepreneur. She is the director of the Interdisciplinary Experimental Design and Architecture Studio, Design Aware. Takbi also started the practice workshop and built well. She has an MR in architecture plus urbanism from the Design Research Lab at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in she is also a fellow of the Startup Leadership Program. Thakbi was named Telangana Young Architect by the Indian Institute of Architects in 2016 and awarded the Emerging Architect of the Year by NDTV Design and Architecture Awards 2016. She was recognized in the annual selection of 50 Emerging Indian Architects and Designers by IGN 50 in 2019. Thakbi is also a TEDx speaker and has presented her works and methods at various design events and online, including the Design Virtual Design Festival. Tagbi has created a series of generative design workshops for students and professionals from all backgrounds called Practice Workshop. This hands-on workshop series combines design, structure, art, mathematics, and computation. Since 2011, the workshop has been to various parts of our country, such as Hyderabad, Chennai, Surat, Roorkee, Kochi, Ahmedabad, and also Dubai, Sharjah, Bahrain, and Doha. The workshop was also in part of 
Dubai Design Week 2018, Hyderabad Design Week alongside the World Design Assembly 2019, resulting in urban installations for the cities of Dubai and Hyderabad. Since May 2020, during the COVID-19 lockdown, the Fractal Workshop has been taught online to participants from all over the world, including India, China, UAE, Egypt, USA, simulating in a virtual reality exhibition of the student work. Now I request architect Tagbi Fatima to preside the Midas webinar series 22. Welcome ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you to the principal of Midas and thank you Jabeen for the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, back at Midas because I actually started the practice workshop. The first workshop was conducted at Midas. So I'm really happy to uh, be connected to Midas once again. Uh, and also thank you to Manju Ma'am, who is uh, my professor from my undergrad. So we have a long, uh, long standing relationship. Uh, so, so I think uh, everyone has a, a fair idea about, um, you know, what my background is. So I'm just going to, um, as, as was mentioned, um, I have a, a master's in architecture and urbanism uh, from the Architectural Association in London. So I'm just going to introduce a little bit about the kind of work that we did uh, at the AA, at the Design Research Lab at the DRL. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, if, you, if not, please let me know. <clears throat> so uh, this is our, you know, part of our studio in, uh, in London. And a lot of times, uh, you know, the design process was really the most important process. So uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, we made a lot of prototypes, we made a lot of models and we worked with our hands and worked with material a lot um, in the studio. So uh, being right in the heart of the city, it wasn't a campus that was separated from the city. So a lot of people, um, you know, we had neighbors in the next building, which was Time Out magazine. So a lot of times our neighbors used to ask us, hello neighbors, what are you making? And we used to frequently answer, we're making monkeys um, because we were, our design process was really evolutionary. It was more of a bottom up design process than a top down design process, which I'll explain a little later. So um, these are some of my classmates and some of the prototypes that we made, um, you know, lots of geometrical uh, experiments and explorations. A lot of materiality was explored in prototyping. And many times we used to wear uh, you know, uh, where the models that we made. So uh, the body became a canvas. And uh, so that's where design aware really started. Uh, I, the, for the first time, we had access to all of this, um, you know, high tech equipment or digital fabrication, um, you know, lab that we had. So um, I began to, during my spare time, uh, during the time that we had, it was a very intensive program of 16 months where we didn't have any weekends off and we worked from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. But during those um, you know, vacations and other periods of time when things were uh, closed, I began to experiment a little bit with the, with the equipment that was available in the, in the digital prototyping lab. Um, and this is where I began to start uh, designing wearables, which were you know, uh, designed with using computational design and layering uh, and, I, and used um, you know, um, fiberglass as the material which is a really interesting material. Uh, so a lot of them were layered and then um, designed on the computer, uh, laser cut and then layered and um, hand assembled. And so when you, this material is so uh, peculiar is, uh, in that it has this fiber optic quality to it. So if you start to add light to it, uh, if you know you add light to just one end of it or one uh, edge of it, all the edges begin to glow. So it's really interesting to note the different layering and the different outlines that are created. Uh, and uh, and we also went into wearable tech uh, proposals with this um, with this you know, initial design that we created. Uh, and then uh, whenever we do any kind of design, we do it in a series. So if we are exploring material uh, in one scale, then we do it for many other, you know, over many different scales and different products. So on the left side, that is not a wearable, but that's called the sunlight, which is a lamp that we designed. Uh, one of our interns working with us designed, and uh, also this uh, card holder is called the terrain ca card holder, where you just light one edge and all of the edges get lit. So the outlines being uh, highlighted and glowing, that's the main um, idea behind this whole series. 
Later on, after I started DesignAware, uh, we were uh, commissioned by the Rajiv Gandhi International Airport to design a, a business center or a kiosk, which, you know, well, an information kiosk at the airport. So uh, we took cues from um, the flight paths of different uh, flights, you know, taking off and landing, and also the um, the landing and taking off paths of the flights. So the way the, the paths can be traced uh, and almost like a light, um, you know, a, um, light art that is uh, created in the sky. So uh, we took cues from that and then we created this design in the same material, which is fiberglass. <clears throat> we proposed this design, which would have just, you know, the edges being lit. So from far away, when you're walking towards it, it's almost like a skeleton or an exoskeleton uh, with an X-ray that is visible that shows just these blue edges that are being lit. And that was the design that we had proposed. So this I'm just showing you uh, to understand the series of, of design explorations and um, you know the series that we create. Another series that we did was um, in rods. So these are metal rods. So initially we did the prototyping in um, you know using bent rods uh, in order to have a representative material, we used uh, plastic disposable straws, drinking straws. So those you can see on the top are explorations um, in prototyping in full scale, one is to one scale. And then we started to you know, translate that into um, the real material, which is metal. Um, and on the right side, the hangular is, um, uh, is a lamp that was, uh, is, a, is a series of, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of, uh, it's a wall art, sculptural kind of wall art, as well as um, a hanging system. Uh, and that was shortlisted for the Trans Excellence Award. Uh, and also this lamp on the left side, which actually came from one of the explorations of one of the workshops that we did at Midas, was, uh, it's called the Deca Lamp. Um, and this was uh, nominated for the Red Dot Design Award. And then carrying forward the, the same theme of translating um, prototypical uh, or prototyping material into real material. So you have this representative material, which is paper. So we, you know, began to do uh, geometric explorations in this material across different scales. So this you can see on the wall is one is to one scale. We wanted to design a feature wall for this ice cream parlor um, in, in Hyderabad, which is called Melting Moments. Uh, and uh, and this also has received the FOAID um, uh, Architecture Ideas Award uh, in 2019. So the feature wall here is made of metal. But the exploration that happened, the, the kind of conception that happened was in paper. And paper uh, was kind of um, similar to origami. We sort of folded the paper and we uh, made different models across different scales. One is to one or one is to 50. And then la later we translated that into metal. So you have, um, you know, you have products, you have lighting and also um, interior design happening in the same kind of mater uh, material exploration or the same material family. Um, so that's the series that I'm talking about. So this is our studio, and also you can see behind me uh, our, our studio design aware, which is headquartered in Hyderabad. But we also have a virtual studio in Dubai. We have uh, we have members in London and as well as Dallas. So uh, our studio is kind of it's it's more of a virtual network that is spread out all over the world. But this is our physical space in Hyderabad. Uh, and uh, we welcome people from all over the country. We have students of architecture, um, architects and design enthusiasts who have visited us almost every month. Uh, you know, since we started back in 2014 or 15, we've had visitors every month. But unfortunately, due to the lockdown in 2020, we didn't have any visitors uh, and we didn't just have, you know, we weren't just impacted by the pandemic, but in addition, uh, in the months of September and October, Hyderabad was hit by an unprecedented flood that uh, was the biggest flood ever since, um, you know, since over 100 years. So you can see the devastation that was caused. But what we did was, you know, we, we lost a lot of our material, a lot of our models. Our studio was submerged for 10 days under the water, uh, two feet of water. Uh, but we decided that, you know, resilience is something that is very important for an architect. So we decided that you know we would take this in a positive way that we would get rid of all the junk. We would get rid of all the things that we didn't want. And we actually got a, a kind of blank slate 
or a tabula rasa to write on all over again. So we started to work all over again from scratch. At the same time, we developed a virtual studio of connections with people all over the world, not just our team, but students, uh, other architects and people from different fields all over the world. We connected with them throughout 2020. Um, so that was uh, the opportunity that arose, and this is actually the 21st online presentation that I'm giving uh, since last March. So I was actually being given instructions about how to run an online presentation, but this is my 21st presentation. Uh, and so the introduction of that's uh, that's kind of the background and to introduce the topic. It's called process over product investigative investigative and generative design methods. So I'd like to introduce a few of our design methods and the pro how the process is important to reach the product. So this is something that I always like to reiterate uh, and I really believe in this only when you become comfortable with uncertainty can you innovate and evolve and we've been you know dealt with a lot of uncertainty in the last year and we're still in very uncertain times. And this is a this is a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. When he said, take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. So it all begins with just taking the first step and doing the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and as I mentioned, we're talking about investigation and generation of design. So investigation begins with the asking of questions, the search for something. So search for answers. Um, and so I would like to present. Um, I'm sorry, there is an echo. Yeah, so um, I'd like to present a few different questions that we asked six uh, uh, different questions that we asked that led to different, um, you know, design outcomes. And while beginning the design process, we would not have known where we are going to head and what the outcome would look like. It's just we just start to ask the questions. And then we get the answer. So the first question is, what is the role of an architect in response to catastrophe? Sorry, I'm getting an echo here. Uh, are you yeah, some also getting an echo? From your end. Uh, all other okay. mics are muted. OK, just mute to one second. Unmute, unmute, unmute. Just a minute. Yes. Can Yeah, talk now. Yes. So oh, okay. the question that we asked was, what is the role of an architect in response to catastrophe? And we are facing these, this catastrophe and a multiple, you know, series of multiple catastrophes one after the other. So during um, the lockdown, we learned that, you know, so many people were affected. Everyone was affected by the lockdown all over the world. But one thing in one um, set of people in particular were the migrant workers, the construction workers who are the backbone of our construction industry, as well as the daily wage workers who really overnight they had nowhere to go. They were out of a uh, source of income. Many of them lost their homes and they had to, you know, uh, make their way back to their native places on foot because of the lockdown on transport. So uh, we decided to run a campaign called Starve the Hunger Virus. This ran in parallel to a lecture series that we organized called Road Less Traveled. Uh, so the premise behind this lecture series was uh, to do away with the misconception that there is only one way of practicing architecture. So in architecture school, we are generally told that you know you would practice architecture as an independent practitioner, uh, or you would work somewhere and you would get your you know you would design and you would get those designs constructed. That is only one role of an architect, one possible role that an architect can take. Architects can also be in many related fields and there are many other ways to be an architect. Uh, you could be, um, you know, an academic, you could be a product designer, you could be in media or writing um, uh, or real estate or environmental design. So all of these different nine different architects were brought together on one platform and all of these architects are located all over the world. And we also had people attending this lecture series from all over the world. And then we um, had a small ticket to this and whatever amount we collected, we diverted to our initiative called Starve the Hunger Virus because hunger is a virus that is much bigger than the pandemic actually because it's going on uh, since a very long time and it's going to go on forever. So we have to somehow contain this and, and 
um, and the way that some some of these volunteers are working on was by distributing um, you know food packages to people in need throughout uh, the city of Hyderabad and also um, we also donated to Medicos del Mundo which is a medical institution at that time Spain was at the peak uh, of the of the coronavirus cases so we donated to this institute we were also featured in um, in several newspapers um, yeah so this is how we ended our um, each of the talks So we didn't say, you know, say cheese. We said say quarantine um, because everyone at that time was stuck at home. This all happened during the lockdown and during the lockdown itself, we connected with people from so many different cities all over the world. So at Design Aware, we've been working um, internationally and we've, we've been working remotely for a very long time now, but um, the rest of the world, not everyone was really open to um, making international connections uh, with people that that were not connected to them physically. So we were able to work across all of these different cities. And that brings us to the question, how can independent discrete agents work to uh, work together towards a common goal? So this is the fractal. The, the fractals workshop. Um, it's been going on for nine years. It's been to many different cities all over the world. Uh, first, obviously, physically, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it started from uh, Midas and then, uh, you know, spread out to many different cities all over India as well as the Middle East. And during the lockdown, we also took this uh, workshop to um, to Europe and to the US and to uh, Singapore and Malaysia and different places as well. The premise of the workshop is that many minds and many hands working together can come together to create something that is much bigger, um, create a result that is much bigger than the sum of its individual parts. So if people were working individually, they would not be able to create something as complex and as evolved as something that is created together as a team. And um, the Fractals Workshop has also been featured on the cover of Surfaces Reporter magazine, um, Parametric House as well, and many different other news outlets. So the workshop is really, um, you know, it has a very analog, uh, hands-on kind of feature to it. This is uh, one of the workshops that has been done in uh, VIT Velour, where uh, students, you can see that students come together in the same space and they build together. And, um, and usually, uh, you know, it ends up with an exhibition of the work. Uh, and we usually use uh, materials which are readily available, which are lightweight, uh, which are, you know, uh, economical uh, and disposable materials like uh, straws, plastic straws, which have been banned now. We're using it for the workshop because they're already manufactured. And then uh, disposable paper cups. This is one that we did in Sharjah, the Sharjah Art Foundation. And a lot of times we also use locally available natural materials. So the materials, um, for example, this one for Dubai Design Week, you can see um, the Burj Khalifa in the background. This is uh, an installation which is permanently located at uh, Dubai Design District, and this is uh, built or, or fabricated using uh, palm midrib. So the, the midribs of the palm trees, which which go to uh, landfills every year, we salvage those and then we uh, use those. That's the local material. It's called arish, and we use those for this installation, which is a hyperbolic paraboloid. Uh, and then you know we need to be adaptable and kind of take these uh, designs which are not a single solution for a single given problem or a single context. So adapt them to different contexts and different locations. So we took the same premise of this workshop using natural materials and then we created this series of installations. This uh, series is called Revex. So uh, we also did this in Hyderabad uh, during Hyderabad Design Week 2019. And this time we used cane, which is the local material here. And we used, uh, you know, you can see that it's a very versatile material, which is uh, which can be straight and it can it can have straight line and it can also have curvaceous lines where you have to kind of let go of control over the material and let the material uh, sort of take a form on its own. Another series of installations uh, or workshops that we did during Hyderabad Design Week and the World Design Assembly uh, was called Collective Intelligence under the Fractals Workshop Series. In this, uh, we were actually uh, commissioned by the government of Telangana 
to uh, design and build uh, several um, installations across the city for this event. So instead of building all the installations ourselves, uh, we decided that students should be given a chance to design and build installations for their city. So we conducted a series of workshops and then we selected this design in one of the workshops. Um, this is um, again um, the exploration or the, the prototyping happened in uh, paper, uh, plastic straws and then students got to work alongside fabricators. So the students learned the fabrication pro process from the fabricators and the fabricators learned the design process from the students. So the students took ownership of the design uh, and the fabrication process and this was built in um, metal and this is installed um, in, in opposite to the public gardens in Hyderabad. Uh, this is in metal um, and it's a permanent installation which we call the peacock. That's the gate of the public gardens you can see. Uh, and this is a parametric design which has resulted from the fractals workshop um, sort of uh, explorations. And what happens to the straws? Uh, one of the, um, you know, uh, uh, one of the zones here, uh, the municipal zones, they uh, adopted all of this, those installations for display in their um, office permanently. Uh, going back to again material exploration. So how do we take a workshop that is so analog and so physically, you know, relevant? So we're using a lot of material. It's dependent on materiality. How do you take this kind of workshop to uh, to the digital realm? Because now we had to conduct this workshop online. So we were reminded of our thesis that we did at the Design Research Lab, where you know we used a lot of different materials, including paper and paper pulp. So this is, uh, I'm sure you can all guess that these are. Um, egg crates and egg crates are made of molded paper pulp and you can they have a very peculiar geometry to them an inherent geometry that dictates the form um, and so even though it's paper pulp which is really soft and pliant you treat it in a certain way that it becomes more structural so um, one uh, kind of set of materials um, which is uh, the trays the egg crates and then ping pong balls. So we didn't use eggs, obviously. We used ping pong, ping pong balls to fill the cavities of the egg crate. And you can see that by just by controlling and programming the different um, ways that we fill the cavities, we get a whole catalog of different design outcomes. And this is one of them where we layered the egg crates and we decided where we would have the, um, the filler material or the ping pong balls located. So this was uh, placed inside an airtight membrane and it was vacuumed. That is, the air was completely pulled out of it. So as you can see, just by sucking the air out, the entire system is rising on its own. So you have a whole series of different, uh, you know, curling and different kind of um, outcomes, uh, formal outcomes that are achieved just by removing the air and by programming the kind of uh, units that are uh, placed in different ways um, in this. So. If, if we were to release the air, then it would just go back to normal and it, it would be independent, discrete units that are uh, only by removal of air, they're working together and they're creating something together. So that's the whole idea of this workshop, independent, discrete uh, units working together to create something together to, that is collective. So uh, we decided to use paper. Everyone has paper at home uh, and then people you know, can just kind of fold it, crease it, tear it, roll it, uh, do whatever they want and make it more structural or more pliant. Uh, it's up to them. So the formal explorations happened this way, where we all uh, worked across different countries and different uh, locations and um, also people from different disciplines joined in. And then we were able to reach out. So it's almost like reaching into their computer remotely and helping them, you know, uh, translate these uh, physical explorations into digital uh, design explorations. So these are some of the designs that came out of it. And then, um, you know, of course, we couldn't have the exhibition, so we decided to have a virtual reality exhibition. So this is one of the uh, virtual reality exhibitions that we had uh, where now we were able to kind of assign a sort of context to it. These are some of the other uh, designs. And then this is the latest exhibition, which is called Interlace. I can share the link with you. So and it's open to all and it's perpetually available and you can enter it and you it's we, we decided to make it less realistic and more surreal. Um, so we know that, you know, we don't need a ground plane in this virtual reality space. Uh, we don't have gravity. We don't have scale. 
and then you can just float around and you can see these designs from any uh, angle that you like um, and you can actually fly around and see the exhibition uh, and at the same time this is hosted on mozilla hubs so you this is more of a social uh, vr platform where you can have many different people um, entering the space and you can have conversations with them just like on social media and that brings us to the next question how can data drive design this is uh, I'm, I'm just going to show you a couple of different projects which were kind of design uh, data driven design. Uh, so this is uh, a project where we were required to design an installation, uh, a temporary installation for the World Government Summit uh, by the Museum of the Future in Dubai. And this was happening in 2019. So these are some of the explorations that came out of it. The, the same uh, design that kind of gives you different explorations from different angles. So this is more like a, a 3D graph. Uh, or a graphical representation of data. So um, you have age group that is being represented by the, the color of the strings. Uh, you have the duration of stay on the website. So we studied the website and then we got this data and we applied it here. So you have duration of stay on the website uh, that shows, uh, you know, the, the length of the string is determined by that. The, the click map uh, shows us, you know, gives us these kind of curves that are then tweaked and adapted and then the dates. Uh, for visiting the, the website over a six month period of time is indicated over these six layers. And these are the different, um, this is the, dip, the kind of different views of uh, the same installation. Um, and, and we also use vectors to determine the direction uh, or directionality of, of these units. So this was uh, how it was proposed, uh, but because of budget constraints, we couldn't get it built. This is another um, unbuilt project, which is uh, call, we call it smart office. So we had to design um, an office space for uh, an IT and IoT company, uh, which which had offices in uh, Hyderabad, USA and Mexico. Uh, and they had products which were sort of home automation products um, and, you know, uh, environmental control products. Uh, so they wanted to showcase these products in their um, in their office itself. So the office would be like their portfolio. So this was an existing building in Jubilee Hills in Hyderabad. It's a commercial area and then um, it, it's a G plus five uh, building and we had to build on the fifth and sixth floor. So we we kind of created a, a structure that would come as a penthouse on the topmost level of the building. So this is our exploration uh, in paper. Uh, we did some prototyping uh, and we also did some uh, digital exploration, creating a beehive sort of structure and an undulating roof. So you can see um, the the facade and the roof are kind of independent of the building itself and so the facade has different depths so it kind of becomes thinner and wider or deeper uh, depending on the the program inside and also where shading is required um, and the entire structure was to be in metal this is the evolution of the um, of the roof structure so we wanted to create an undulating uh, surface that was a, a kind of an extrusion of these uh, of the beehive or the of the hexagonal packing that is happening in the facade. These are some of the daylighting studies to understand, um, you know, heat gain, uh, and then we created something. Uh, you know, we wanted to create something that um, that takes inspiration from traditional. Indian architecture at the same time it's contemporary. So we took certain principles such as the, the central courtyard, uh, the jollies or the screens that shade from the heat and provide privacy. Um, and so we created this uh, design and you can see on the right side there are working individual work pods. So people have different ways of working. Uh, some like to work in isolation and a quiet uh, space for working. So these pods are for them. And then there are you know more open spaces that people like to work. Uh, collectively in a, in a large space. And even though this is on the fifth and sixth floor, this gives you a feeling of a ground floor with this green space that becomes the heart of the entire office space that you can see it from everywhere. And that really uh, gives you this um, a kind of positive feeling because you have a green space right in the building, uh, even though you're on the top floor. Uh, this is an informal seating area, so uh, it also becomes formal. So a lot of spaces need to evolve and adapt to to uh, different functions. And then you have this Zoom uh, meeting sort of 3D wall that we created. This was actually an existing water tank and we proposed for it to become a 3D wall because it could not be moved. 
So this is more of, a, of an interactive wall. Uh, and we uh, propose the use of all of these uh, products from this company. Uh, for example, uh, they have products which would be able to measure how many flushes or how much water was used in the flush, uh, how much, um, you know, what the um, temperature is like outside. And in relation to that or in response to that, the temperature of the building would be adjusted. So if it's a sunny day outside, then uh, the temperature would go lower. Uh, and if it's a rainy day outside, the temperature would be uh, higher. And then also the, the tinting of the of the glass would um, be in response to the temperature outside. So so it has multiple uses. Uh, what's really interesting is that, you know, this is an existing building and you have this kind of almost like an alien spaceship that has landed on the roof of the building. Um, and usually when you see uh, buildings which are, you know, the top floor of the building, you never you're not never able to look inside it because you're viewing it from the ground floor. You're you, you're viewing it from the street below. So from the street level, you can't really look head on into the elevation. But uh, what was uh, what was right, uh, quite surprising and serendipitous was that the metro at the same time came up at that time uh, in the same location. So you can actually now see. Uh, from the metro, you will be able to see, look into the building and you're able to get that view as well. So the next question is how can material dictate design? We do a lot of different material explorations at Design Aware. We do, you know, uh, I've shown you paper, I've shown you metal um, and fiberglass. We also use a lot of um, fabric and we wanted to create uh, something that makes fabric more structural rather than something that is really soft and pliant and just a, just a covering. So you, here you can see this is an exploration of a, a workshop that we started called the Cloud Machine at the Design Research Lab. Uh, and then we designed a canopy. Um, and you can see the, that in the canopy there are these uh, rigid members and then there are fabric members. And the fabric that is being used here is four-way stretch lycra. So it's a stretchable fabric that has been stretched uh, at different intervals within these curved rigid members. But what's really um, interesting to note is that the fabric is actually structural. These rigid members are non-structural. So if you were to cut off the fabric at any point, the entire system would collapse in on itself. So it would not be able to be held up uh, without the fabric. So there is an element of tensegrity that is happening within the system where the fabric is structural and holding up the entire system. And the fabric has many different, you know, uh, nuances to it. So you're using tailoring techniques and you're applying them to architecture. So you can see some of the tucks and some of the stitches that are happening here. Similarly, we designed um, a mosque. Uh, we call it a micro mosque because it's a very tiny mosque located inside uh, the parking garage. So two parking spaces were dedicated to this mosque, um, which we designed and built within two weeks. Uh, so we did the design as well as the construction just in time for the holy month of Ramadan. So this was this mosque was designed for elderly citizens of this uh, very old building. So you can see the nuances that are happening uh, within the uh, you know within the kind of surface. So this is the main feature wall of the mosque, which is called the mihrab, which is the orientation device. And within that, you can see um, you know that's where we used fabric. Um, and then, uh, and of course, fabric has its own, you kind of allow it to do its own thing because it has that stretchable quality to it. So um, I showed you a very tiny project just now, so that's a constraint. Um, so the question is, how can creativity take birth from constraints? So I'm going to show you a couple of projects which are really dictated and, and uh, the, the design kind of evolved from the constraints that were given to us. So this is again located in Hyderabad and Jubilee Hills where it's a really high, uh, hilly terrain. So Hyderabad is a really uh, kind of undulating terrain with a lot of rocks and a lot of, um, you know, mountains to it. So um, this is on the higher part of the city called Jubilee Hills. And um, and then there is this drop on the left side you can see. So you can, you, the orange one is our site. Uh, and on the left, lower left side, you can see that there is a drop. So it's almost like it's on the, on the top of a mountain. So that's the shape of our site. It's quite peculiar in that it's it's kind of skewed and it has these, uh, you know, it's a parallelogram shaped site which has these opposite angles, which are acute angles. So in this project, we had to follow Vastu as well. So in Vastu, you can only use 90 degrees and um, and also 90 degree, you know, orthogonal um, spaces are much better for residential spaces. So this was a family residence that we had to uh, design. 
And, uh, and so these were some of the explorations for us to understand how we could make the most use of this, uh, you know, weirdly shaped site. How can we cover the most area within this parallelogram shaped site? Uh, in in the ground on the ground plane as well as on the facade, we decided to create something that is more stepped. So at every step, you increase the step, and you would be able to increase the area uh, of the facade as well as the the floors. So this is some stacking. I like to play with a lot of materials that you have, you know, found objects that you have lying around. So uh, these are just staples which I stack together to see. Uh, to do the massing and the exploration of the form and to see how we would be able to best occupy the most space within that space. So within that site, so you can see that we stretched the top of the, um, you know, of the entire mass and then we began to slice it and you get this stepped kind of facade. So on the ground floor as well as the upper floors. So on every floor you have steps and then as you go uh, over you know, to the upper floors as well, you increase the floor area by three feet at every level. These are some of the explorations. So you can see that um, on each floor you have three steps, three, three feet uh, advancing in front um, and covering more area. And then at every level you have three feet off overhang. So this is the, the design that came out of it. This is uh, now under construction. So this is um, the facade. Uh, so you can see the it's almost like these boxes which are just stacked one on top of the other. And then the facade has this um, sort of um, louver system, uh, which is kind of, you have these louvers which are twisted at different angles, so they allow light filtration to, uh, to happen at different angles, and you also have privacy in different spaces. So this is a section, you can see that overhang on the left side um, at every floor. And then you have the, um, you know, this, which is um, on our wall. So this is one is to 50, so we like to work across different scales. So we had blown up uh, the floor plans, and then we started to sketch more in detail over the floor plans uh, on the wall itself. And these are the floor plans you can see on the left side. I'm not going to get into the detail of the spaces. Um, obviously, it's a residence, so it has all the usual living uh, spaces. Uh, so on the ground floor, the the area, the the footprint of the building is really small. And then the upper level, you have the footprint being bigger and then bigger and then much bigger. And you can see that it fits within the uh, within the outline of the site. So it comes within the site boundary, but it also, um, you know, it is still orthogonal. So as I was saying about the facade, the, the facade is a is a kind of computationally designed facade where we have, um, you know, based on the, the functions of the spaces or the program within the, that space, uh, the, the louvers twist and they reveal more or less of the inside. So uh, if you have green spaces or open spaces, you have, um, you know, they, they twist at an angle such that it opens up uh, about 75% or 90% open. Uh, and then if you have bedrooms, then you have only 25% open because you need more privacy. Uh, for the dressing room, you have 90% closed uh, and so on. So some of these are fixed and some of them allow, you know, those spaces to, uh, or have openable and closable louver systems. So it almost works as uh, a kind of curtain that you can control and you can open and close. So uh, this is how it looks from outside. And in the middle, you have all these green spaces in the center and also on top. So these are the overhangs at every level. And this is the top floor. So when you see it from the inside, it has a different kind of view to it because on the top floor, um, there is a lot more privacy in the sense that there is there are no neighboring buildings which are right next to it at the same level. So you can see beyond this, you can actually see the Golconda Fort and you can see the, the sprawling city below. So you have the pool and a party hall on the uppermost level and you can have the louvers uh, much more open uh, in these spaces. And then for the bedrooms, the louvers are kind of there are you know um, constraints to how much you can open and close it. So it almost acts like a curtain. And then you can layer it with a series of other, you know, sheer curtains and heavy curtains to create different filtration of uh, different kind of filtration um, uh, of light. So you have different options that are coming out of it. The green space has has larger openings, and then you have the um, dressing area, which has really minute openings uh, with a small angle of opening. Uh, but also there is light filtration happening through the um, through the clothing, which is really interesting. We took the same um, motif 
uh, and made it 2D. So that was 3D and then we kind of translated that into 2D drawing and then we created the same design for the doors as well. This is now under construction. This is the level it has reached. And we also started an initiative uh, during the pandemic. So last year in March, we started this called Design Aware. Uh, sorry, called Build Aware uh, in a company to uh, accompaniment to Design Aware. So in order to gain better control over the output, over the product, uh, we decided that we would um, take control of the construction process as well. So um, we have this parallel initiative for some of the projects uh, that we uh, think that we can do justice to. We take them up for design as well as construction. So we are, uh, you know, crazy enough to start a new uh, company during the pandemic. We also started this um, program, this education program called Studio to Site. So a lot of times, um, this is my personal experience and I've also noticed greatly that students are not taken to site very regularly. So they might have a few site visits to construction sites, but the entire role of an architect on site, the protocol, the procedures on site, and also the entire construction process from uh, conception to realization. This is not something that students are exposed to, uh, though it's a very important part of architecture. So we decided that, and also young architects, young designers, even when they're working um, in design firms, they're not really exposed to the site as much. And so they don't have the confidence to have the command over the site as an architect should. So we decided to run this program called Studio to Site, where we take young architects as well as students uh, and young designers to uh, the site, to our uh, live construction sites, and we show them what's happening from start to finish at every stage. Uh, of course, during the lockdown, we couldn't uh, really do that. So we also conducted online uh, programs where we taught them about project management. So this is a Gantt chart and we are teaching them about how uh, they can uh, manage, you know, different projects on site using the Gantt chart. Uh, this is our uh, lead interior designer who's uh, teaching on site. So after the lockdown was reopened and construction activity resumed, we are back on site with all of the safety precautions and all of the things that are required. And then we've started the studio to site program once again directly on site uh, in our sites in Hyderabad. So this brings us to our final question. Where does nature end and the built environment begin? So in this previous project, uh, previous site, you can see that there's a tree, uh, a couple of trees there which we are preserving uh, and we don't cut down any of the trees on site. So we built this in, we're building this entire house around these trees. So similarly, that's the question. Where does nature end and the built environment begin? This is the Golconda Fort in Hyderabad, which is um, the you know more than 800 years old. It's made of granite, the same rock that you can see in the front there. So that this rock or sheet rock, which is um, a, a feature of the Deccan Plateau, this is more than 250 million years old. So in this one image, you can see our built environment and our natural you know, uh, our built heritage and our natural heritage in the same image. So in this context, we were asked to design a charity school for children of disadvantaged backgrounds uh, who were living in and around the Golconda Fort area, and the site is located within the fort walls. So the fort walls, you can see the outer walls here. If you can see my pointer, you'll be able to see the, the fort walls. This is a Google, um, Google Maps image, and you can see that this is the uh, inner wall and the outer wall of the Golconda Fort. The Golconda Fort contains a settlement which, uh, you know, dates back to 800 years and the entire, you know, kingdom of Golconda or the city of Golconda was contained within these fort walls before, before Hyderabad was established. So, um, so you can see that it's a really low rise, high density kind of settlement within the fort walls, within the outer walls, and our site is also located within those walls. And uh, and you can see that, you know, on the upper right hand corner uh, on, on that quadrant, you can see that it's really dense. You have densely packed residential structures there. And then on the lower left quadrant, you can see that it's completely empty tracts of space. It's not because, you know, that space is not, um, that's completely open and uh, build, unbuilt. But the reason for that is because this is really steep, unbuildable slope. So it's on the mountain and you can't really build on that. Uh, it's, it becomes too steep to build. That's why it's not being built. So this entire thing is almost on the highest uh, peak of the of the city of Hyderabad. So the, the highest level within the city uh, is the Golconda area. And 
Here you can see a little more of the rock that, that I'm talking about. And this is the school as seen from above. This is after construction, so we had to kind of sneak in. Uh, this is a military area, so we are not allowed to take drone imagery. So please don't tell anyone. We've, we were able to sneak in the drone and take pictures after construction. This uh, is the context that we were working with. So as any other Indian city, really closely packed, you know, uh, neighboring houses with shared walls, courtyard houses, which have ventilation from the courtyard, um, and then packed completely, densely packed, and self-designed and self-built houses, uh, which are built by their own owners. And you can see that they're very colorful and kitschy, and, and the walls in addition, uh, the, the lanes in addition to this are, um, you know, really, narrow and steep winding lanes in this area because it's a mountain. There's so many goats. Um, and again, this is a Google Maps image from 2014 before we, uh, you know, when we first got involved with the project. So when we first got involved with the project, this is how it was. There was an existing school. Everything that is uh, in orange lines is is the existing one or, or the upper level one. Everything that is in solid lines is existing and dotted lines has been demolished. So uh, the site is actually divided into two different levels. So you have a lower level and you have an upper level and you have this cliff that is going through the site. And the difference between these two levels is 20 feet or six and a half, almost six and a half meters, which is like two floors of height variation with, between these two level, these two um, parts of the site. So there was an existing school on site. There was an existing mosque, which was designed and uh, built by the client themselves before we were involved in the project. And this is how it was. You had a playground on the upper level and you had this kind of this retaining wall that was filled with soil and it was flattened to create this playground on the upper level and that uh, further demarcated the, the height difference between these two levels. So you have the lower level here uh, in white, which is, you know, which was uh, on the lower level. And then there was this courtyard house that was existing and they purchased and demolished the courtyard house to create an entrance from below. So you have one entrance from this narrow courtyard house, the lane that I just showed you, you have one entrance from below. If you call this the zero level, you can go all around the, the you know, climb and then you go all around this lane and you can enter from the playground, which is at six and a half meters level, two floors above the, the previous entrance. This is the lower level. That's me uh, before construction. On the right side is the existing courtyard house. So you can see the narrow entrance there. The on the left side is the cliff and the existing retaining wall. So we call this the lower ground. You can see that it's like a wall of rock that is dividing both of the parts of the site. And then you you have the upper ground level. So both of them are ground, but one is lower and one is upper. And so you have the upper ground level with the retaining wall and the and the playground that has been created. It's almost like a box of soil that contains the play, the playground. And then on the left side was the existing school, the existing courtyard house below. And in the background, the majestic Gol Golconda Fort, uh, Lanko Hills and uh, Qutub Shahi tombs. Um, and then if you turn around, you're able to see if you're on the playground, you just turn around, you can see the Golconda Fort all around you because you are inside the fort. So you see the fort walls all around you. You have the existing school, which was just a big, uh, large hall with partitions in it, the existing mosque. And this is how the site was laid out. This is the existing one. So you have um, you know, you have the courtyard house below among other houses and then you go up, you can climb up and you have the existing school, uh, the playground, which is like a box of soil. So this is the inside of that existing school. The school was only it, it had been running in a very informal manner uh, by this charity and it was only till fifth standard and they wanted to expand it. They wanted to get it registered and run it like a proper school. So they needed a building for that. So this was just a large shed with uh, partitions for classrooms and it's almost like a jail. It's a very uninspiring, dark and sort of uh, really not not how a school should be. But unfortunately, this is how charity schools frequently are. Due to lack of funds and uh, and then in contrast, when you see the outside, it's completely you know, different. It's bright. It's really nice and um, and clean and you have green uh, trees and then you have uh, children who are used to learning under the trees uh, as in our traditional system of learning. So this is the principal teaching them. Sometimes they have class under the trees. And what's different about these kids is that 
they are living in an urban metropolitan city, but at the same time, they are used to climbing the mountains and climbing the rocks and the rugged terrain because their own homes are nestled between these rocks, between these mountains. And one of the principles uh, that we um, followed, so we before we begin any design process, we lay out the principles first and then we follow those principles. So we, we follow this mantra, which is, you know, remain um, married to the process and divorced from the result. So the result or the product is not so important. We don't know what the final product is going to be. The process is something that is very, very much of importance and we control the process and we take, go through the process and immerse ourselves in that. So in order to define the process, the first defining thing is the principles. And in this project, the principles that we followed were to preserve the existing rock on, soil, uh, on site. So on the right side, you can see some of these are boulders, but these are really huge boulders. Uh, and, and, you know, many tons of weight. But on the left side, most of this is sheetrock. It cannot be moved. It has to be broken or, or blasted. And this is a heritage zone. This is a residential area. And ecologically also, it would not be ethical to destroy those that rock. So we wanted to preserve the rock on site. We wanted to preserve all of the trees existing on site. It's a very difficult terrain. So we had to do multiple site surveys. We had to do geological surveys. We had to profile the existing rock on site. And we did multiple studies and analysis of the site, uh, making different models at different scales and different materials and different ways uh, of uh, translating the site. Uh, and that took us most, uh, you know, a very long time to understand the site. And so the site dictated the entire design. And the site actually, uh, you know, the, the the, the, the building itself grew from the site, you could say. So this is the entrance from the lower level, which is, you know, which used to be the uh, old uh, courtyard house. So you can see the, the narrow house there, narrow space there. And then you can go around and then you have the entrance uh, from the top there. The existing school or the existing hall was just kept as it was. And we added this building, which was uh, the entire school uh, population was shifted into this building. So it had space for all the classrooms um, and then you can see this is how it looks from above. So another principle, so one of our principles was preserving rock. The other one was preserving the trees and the third one was preserving the playground. So the playground is an asset to us. It was, you know, in most of these urban schools, you don't even have playgrounds. You have to use the roof as a playground or or block out the street as a playground. And the existence of this playground was uh, like a lung space and a very valuable asset. So we decided that even though it would be really easy for us to build on that flat part of the site, we decided to build on the cliff side, which was much more difficult. Uh, in order to preserve this playground, we achieved that um, that principle. So you can see that's the entrance. And this is how this, the school kind of immerses and situates itself or interlocks itself like a puzzle fitting into the existing uh, context with these uh, existing um, houses all around it. Um, and so and when we started to excavate, so we did all these site analysis and studies, right? But we when we went on site, we realized that we had to change a, a lot of the design because as we started to excavate the site, we were uncovering more and more rock. So the rock really, uh, you know, we had to some in some places we had to shrink this the, the space and then in some places we were able to grow the plant. So the plant shrinks and grows at different levels and it has different uh, shapes as we go up. And we call it mid lower ground, middle ground and upper ground uh, because the each floor touches the ground at different levels and the middle ground you can see is bigger. And the reason for this is that we removed the retaining wall. We took out the soil from that from that container of soil that was created because we knew that this was filled in and there must be space under it, so uh, inside it. So whatever uh, two classrooms that we lost on the ground floor, we were able to make it make up for it by removing the retaining wall and removing the excavating that soil and then creating space for these two classrooms. Um, and uh, there is there is a really um, fun story to that is that the, the client didn't want to uh, you know, remove the retaining wall because it was very, you know, uh, it was very solid and uh, they said that it would uh, be pointless to remove or demolish something that is already existing. So uh, we were trying to come up with different ideas. That monsoon of 2016, um, the, the rains were really heavy and the rains 
naturally brought the retaining, the corner of the retaining wall down uh, and they broke the retaining wall. So we were able to, so God was on our side. We were able to excavate and we were able to gain two more classrooms there. So you can see on the ground floor, uh, the middle ground and the upper ground, everything touches the ground at some point, And that's the section. We also took some inspiration or some cues from the neighboring context. So the context is really important as well. So the neighborhood, the neighboring houses, we look, looked at the colorful, you know, colors that were used there. And then we decided to use some of uh, some primary colors along with green and orange uh, in a very controlled manner in pops of color throughout the school. So this is a, uh, this is a transparent model in fiberglass. Uh, and then we, you can see that all the walls and everything is sort of invisible and only these pops of color are visible. So uh, this is a model that we uh, made in our studio, which is on permanent. It's part of the permanent exhibition in the Hebei Art Museum uh, Design Museum in China. So this is the lower entrance. You can see that it's completely, you know, it's gray and blank. We didn't color the walls um, on the left side. That's the entrance, the lower entrance. So only the walls, uh, sorry, the, the doors, the gates, the windows, the railings, the staircase and the skylight. These are the, um, you know, the things that are the elements that are colored and everything else remains raw and exposed and blank and sort of gray. So in the facade, you can see it's just slate and slate is a really nice, uh, you know, stone which uh, later weathers and changes color. So we allow the elements to work on it uh, and the reason why we kept the facade so blank was that it's completely in contrast uh, and stands out from the rest of the context, which is really colorful and residential. So we wanted the school to stand out as a as a kind of public building in this context. And on the right side, you can see that there is this uh, double height space. So this used to be the courtyard uh, of this courtyard house, and then it was demolished. Uh, and then this is the space that came up. So in order to pay homage to that existing in that old courtyard house, we created these cutouts that bring in ventilation right, uh, you know, and, and sunlight right into the into the every part of the building. And you can see on the right side, the rock has been preserved and there are some steps there. The reason why there are steps here and there is because uh, as we excavated, we found different levels of rock and we didn't want to destroy that. We uh, in response to that, we created levels. So this is a bright red staircase that forms like the spine of the building that cuts through the building and connects all of the different levels. So that's the red staircase connecting all the levels. And, and then we proposed a green space uh, around this rock. Um, and you know, you're know you bringing the outdoors in as well. So from everywhere you can look down, you see the rock and the rock sort of embraces, sometimes the building embraces the rock and sometimes the rock embraces the building from the outside. So this is one of the classrooms which has the wall as the rock itself. That's the staircase going up again. So you have two atriums or two cutouts that are created, one over the courtyard house and one on the other side to bring in natural ventilation uh, from the top. A lot of times, you know, as I said, we had to change the design. We had to take design decisions on site. So this is us sketching on site and sort of responding to the site conditions and making quick sketches and quick uh, drawings on, on the site itself, on the left side, that's a sketch that I made. And then uh, we created this kind of bridge that connects the opposite side. So above the, the courtyard house, it's a, it's a one and a half floor height, 15 feet height. And then you have this box above, which is the staff room. So the staff room is like, um, you know, on the other side in a very private area, but at the same time, it has these windows, which gives, uh, the, gives the principal the view of the entire school everywhere. So everywhere they can see everything from there. So this bridge is also sort of inspired by um, on the right side is a is a reference image, which is um, in the old city of Hyderabad, you would have these old houses which had these bridges going over the street. So you have a public street, but you have a private bridge connecting two parts of the same house on either side of the street. Uh, this is called a chatta or a damdama, and this um, bridge kind of reminds us of that. And so this is uh, this is one view where you can see that every part of this building is completely naturally ventilated uh, and passively cooled. So uh, you don't need to turn on any of the artificial lights. We have provided, obviously provided artificial, you know, uh, sorry, electrical points, but they haven't even installed tube lights uh, anywhere because it's completely naturally ventilated. 
and uh, and you can see the stark contrast between the gray walls and the and the colorful um, you know doors, windows, and other elements. Um, and another reason why we didn't paint most of the walls in the school is because of maintenance. So you um, you know it, this is a charity building, so you have to look at the cost of construction. So we kept it at a, as a low cost building, but at the same time, the cost of maintenance. So you have to look at not just after you hand over the building and move out, you're not done then. You, the architect had to think about the future life of the building as well. So in this, the future life, uh, we would also uh, run into costs of maintenance. If we painted the walls, we would have to paint them again and again. So we convinced the client that we would uh, let it remain raw. But they wanted the classrooms to be really bright, so you can see that the bright uh, the classrooms are sort of pastel colored color coded. What's very interesting about this school is that some of the spaces we left them open to interpretation. So it's really important for us to not over design, but under design. So the entire project is kind of like a work in progress, especially this project. Even after it's being used, it's kind of evolving. So you can see that you know, the students are using this corridor, which is quite a wide corridor. They're using it uh, in ways that we would never have imagined before. We didn't uh, intend for that, but that's really heartening. Uh, and this um, this is the library. So the library, uh, actually, when we were building the library, this part has a rock under it. So this again has the part of the mountain, the, the peak of uh, you could say under this space. And so we almost lost this entire space. So we suggested that let's make the library a more uh, kind of informal space because these kids are used to jumping, uh, climbing the rocks. So we could just keep the rock as as the floor, but the client was a little apprehensive. So the next best thing was we kept we created this step seating, which is an informal sort of seating. So the library should be something attractive rather than a space where children are uh, afraid to go. There's pin drop silence, very formal chairs and tables, and you can't make any noise. So instead, it's an informal space that they can enjoy. Now, everyone is working remotely nowadays, but this was back in 2016 or 17 when we had the library built and I was traveling abroad at the time. So this is my series of conversations over WhatsApp with the carpenter. Uh, so this entire project was a very participatory uh, and inclusive project. Uh, in which we included many different agents in the design process. So the people who were, you know, stakeholders, the, the chairperson, the students, the teachers, as well as the fabricators and carpenters who worked on this project were also made a part of the design process. So in this, for the library, we designed uh, a sort of system which is an adaptive system or a prototypical system. So we designed, um, you know, we, we laid down guidelines for the sizes of the doors, the proportions, the number of doors, the number of um, you know glass uh, doors, and number of closed doors, the color palette, and these are the guidelines that we provided to, to the carpenter. And we allowed the carpenter to kind of take certain design decisions. So this is me communicating with him uh, while he was on site, while I was traveling on WhatsApp. And so I would give credit, equal credit, to the carpenter also for the design of this library, a uh, very informal kind of bright library that was created, a library and audiovisual room. We lost the library also for another reason, because uh, they didn't have the budget to buy books for the library. So at that time, uh, we understood that it was very, very important for children uh, from these backgrounds uh, to have access to a library and to learn, you know, to inculcate reading, because at home they would not probably not have this atmosphere of reading books. They may not have access to books at home because they come from a lower income background and maybe a low education background. So this uh, school and library is the only place that, where they would, uh, you know, where they would learn the joy of reading and discover the joy of reading. So we decided we started this campaign online called Make Progress Possible, where we called, uh, you know, we tapped into our network online, our social media network or friends and relatives, anyone who was willing to donate uh, children's used children's books for the school library. So the first year we collected about 250 books from our own books as well as different sources, and then we donated it to the library, and that's when we saved the library. And year on year, every year uh, in the month of Ramadan, which is a, a charitable month of giving, we, we receive a lot of donations. We receive donations of uh, sports equipment, educational toys, as well as uh, people providing midday meals, 
uh, and uh, lots of monetary donations as well, not just from India, uh, but from all over the world every year. So these are the students using the spaces. Now, this is a very different school in that uh, the building was occupied. It was built phase wise as and when they were able to raise funds being a charity, but it was also, um, you know, it was built incrementally and it was occupied as it was being constructed. So when some of the spaces, they, they were in such urgent need of space that as uh, we built a few classrooms, they were occupied by the student and the construction was still going on. And this is still the case. So the students are regularly attending classes. Sometimes the goats are also attending. Um, and as I said, part of the school was not constructed when it was being occupied. So this is when uh, this is this um, kind of uh, the, the uh, double height space that lets in sunlight into the heart of the building. So this was supposed to have a skylight, but the skylight was added much later when they were able to raise funds for that. Um, so a lot of times the, the rain used to come into the building and the kids used to play in the rain inside their school. And this is a perforated block wall towards the north that brings in cool air and provides shade. Um, and also children learn in its shade. Um, and you can see that the skylight is then later it was uh, added. Uh, and you know, also uh, what's different about the school is you're allowed to, the kids are allowed to write on the walls. So this is probably you know, not allowed in any school, but this school, because we didn't paint the walls, they're allowed to write on the walls and they can easily just uh, you know, dust it off and it would not cause any damage. This is the skylight that was geometrically, you know, uh, sort of geometrically driven, computationally designed. Uh, and then this again, a lot of work happens. The design work also happens on site. So because it's a charity school, we have an ensemble team. Everyone uh, is uh, sort of donating their time rather than you know taking any sort of fees for their for their expertise. So we have our structural consultant on the left side, uh, you know, showing the fabricator uh, the design, the structural design for the sky for the truss of the skylight, um, and he's he's learning there. And then on the right side, we've created this prototype. Uh, so we all, always, along with our drawings, very detailed drawings, but we also give scaled models of prototypes. And we see, we understand that uh, for some designs, which are geometrically uh, kind of different and, you know, uh, double sort of double curved geometry or sort of geometry, which is not easy to replicate in drawings, you have to have, the, have it in 3D. And we also notice that fabricators are much more comfortable with the models. They understand because the model is there, so they're able to build it. And this is how the skylight uh, has come up. Um, and and you can see the you know uh, the playground there, the old school, the mosque, and everything. So um, we also designed the logo. Um, you can see that the logo also mimics the sort of terrain and the and the layout of the school with the ground plane and the upper part and the lower part. These are some of the you know before and after images. This was the old school in the old building, uh, just just a large hall uh, with partitions. You can see, um, and these are the new classrooms in 2017. This is that old building which has now been completely vacated, and this has been turned into a nursery, um, a dining hall, and a kindergarten. And as I said earlier, it's a participatory design process. So the teachers themselves designed this, redesigned this space. They took the color palette from our building that we designed and they applied it to this matching the old the building and it's it looks new. That's the Golconda port and under construction during construction. And you can see that the kids, um, you know, take the shade and they learn under under the perforated wall and they use the wall also as a blackboard. There was a Telugu class going on at this time when I took this picture. And then in 2017 it was still under construction but being used for the assembly and this was in 2020 um, and of course every year we have you know people visiting from all over so, so this is how the school situates itself in the greater context of the Golconda fort so every uh, sorry every month we have groups of uh, people from all over india who you know groups of students from different colleges um, the school has kind of become a landmark in hyderabad for uh, these uh, college tours um, so we have visitors from everywhere uh, every year since you know since it was since 2016 or so till 2019 it was also featured on tv5 
Um, but in 2020, all that stopped because nobody could travel or you know visit and the school remained closed. So um, instead, I uh, you know put a camera on my head and I did a virtual tour uh, of the school, which you can see on design uh, on the design YouTube uh, channel during the virtual uh, design festival that design conducted for 2020. Um, and in that there is a live sort of interview and a, and a walk through the school. You can also see the Golconda Fort, which is very beautiful. You'll be able to see that if you look it up on YouTube. And uh, ours was the only Indian firm to participate in the virtual design festival uh, by design. This is, uh, it was published in many different publications. I'm just showing a select few, Hyderabad Design Diaries during Hyderabad Design Week. Most recently, and we're really, really uh, honored to have our school design as a case study by the uh, Royal Institute of British Architects Rethink Design Guide, Architecture for a Post-Pandemic World. So they were trying to understand what design changes we need to make to our you know, design methods of design or design processes or the kind of spaces that we design um, in order to respond to the pandemic and the new social distancing and other um, you know, uh, ventilation, natural ventilation and these kind of uh, requirements now. So our school is is serving as a case study uh, for an, uh, a kind of school that can be emulated in this uh, design guide. This this is a uh, as I said, it's completely naturally ventilated um, and you know uh, it has many green aspects to it. So it has been awarded the silver award as a green building uh, by the Indian Green Building Council in 2018. And this year, hopefully we hope to renew it to get a gold rating because we're adding um, quite a few more elements. We've uh, received multiple awards over the years. Uh, I was also named Emerging Architect of the Year by NDTV Design and Architecture Awards in 2016 for this because of this project, uh, also by the IAA. Um, I have a TEDx talk on YouTube, which you can uh, check out. You'll probably be able to find it if you just search for my name. Um, and most recently, we were long listed for the Design Awards 2020. Uh, and featured on our on my um, college page at the AA page, uh, but we didn't win this award. But it's an honor to be long listed as well. It's very competitive. And uh, on Sunday, I was um, awarded the Women's Leadership Award 2021 by Hibis TV. So I'm just going to stop the share. Thank you. Um, I think I've gone a little bit over time, but thank you for your patience and thank, thank you for um, for giving me the time and attending my talk. I'll let go. I think if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, good afternoon, uh, Tabir, ma'am. It's really, uh, can you hear me? Uh, it's not very loud. Uh, now? Yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really a happy yeah, and happy pleasure and to, you know, attend your webinar uh, because I was your student when you were teaching in CSIT and even the Manju ma'am was teaching. It was really happy and, you know, uh, it's kind of a refreshing uh, for me to attend your webinar and as well as uh, throughout your project when you are giving a talk about it, it was really happy to, you know, understand uh, whatever we have. Mm -hmm in our basic design and then the importance of the patents to apply and even the color theories you have used in your various projects and then also the materials, uh, the exploration of the materials you have Okay, my question is about actually very uh, a small question like why do you design process but uh, throughout your overall thought process you have followed for your project uh, what the, uh, you know, the software, um, you know, because nowadays, you know, whenever we teach to the students or wherever we, uh, you know, tell them to uh, work on the paper or maybe to explore on the paper. So basically they will look for the software which will be helpful for them. So my question is about 
how the software play a role uh, while you were dealing with the different thought process or maybe uh, you know the different materials you have uh, explored in your uh, different different projects because you have worked on your uh, um, like the school kind of a project you have worked on a cafeteria you have worked on a other things also like the urbanism urbanism projects and everything so my question is about like you know the how the software plays uh, a role uh, you know the important role it can be or maybe a minimal role also so uh, it will be helpful if you give a uh, input on that like uh, what was the um, you know uh, the importance of a software plays in the project overall the thought process basically thank, thank you. you thank you thanks for your question nice um, I, i'm really happy to reconnect with you here after csiit uh, really happy to um, talk to you and thank you for the question i think it's a really important question and i have been talking about this in other conversations as well um i think there is uh, you know there are two uh, extremes that we have uh, being in teaching as well as in practice i can see that what i've seen what i've observed is that either uh, students are not really allowed to use software or um, and maybe as a result of that sometimes students are heavily reliant completely on software so these are the two extremes that I have observed from an academic point of view. So I would encourage, you know, every kind of um, like uh, educator to sort of not put a ban on the use of software. And I think it's really um, it's it's good to encourage students to uh, use relevant software, which I'll I'll be telling you a little later. But that's that's my advice: is that software should be introduced at a much earlier level because students are, uh, you know, now software has become so uh, completely, uh, you know, taken over every field and there are so many opportunities to learn, uh, learn different kinds of software that students are just, if they're not allowed to do it in the school, if they're not allowed to use it in the college, they're learning outside and they're learning on their own anyway. So before that stage comes uh, when they're allowed to do it in the second year or third year, they already know and they've already been using it. So I think it's really important to incorporate that into our curriculum. So on the other hand, um, what kind of software, as you asked, we uh, for us in our studio, um, digital and analog go hand in hand. So it's not just completely software driven and it's not completely analog or physical models that we make. All of these, you know, design because uh, the kind of software that we use, which is just maybe 3D, uh, let's say 3D modeling software like Rhino, if we use that, then this, that just allows us to create something that is more, um, you know, geometrically robust and then uh, accurate as well. So it's a super accurate software in which you can measure and then you can, um, there are ways to create those geometries or recreate those geometries in the physical world as well. So if you design something uh, on the computer using 3D modeling, you, Rhino or any other software I'm sure allows you to translate that into physical models. And this is what we always do. We may start with a physical model and go into the software, but we come back, translate that back into the physical model again, uh, or we might start digitally and then uh, we go into the analog and then we come back into the software. So it's always back and forth. So the digital design and digital fabrication or prototyping go hand in hand. So there are multiple ways of translating those designs. You can print out the design as a flattened pattern and you can sort of uh, recreate it. So this is one, I think this is an example. So it's just a flat piece of paper, which you can, if I design this as a model on, this is a calendar actually that we designed called the Geodesk. So if I design this as a 3D model uh, on the computer, then I can flatten it out and then I can make it as a physical model uh, and vice versa. And also uh, this allows us, and I think the importance of the physical model cannot be stressed enough. It allows us to really play with our hands and imagine uh, materiality and also scale, and we can work across different scales. So you can work in different scale, smaller scales and bigger scale, and then you will be able to do multiple models to understand the scale when you're working with physical models. So I think um, other than that, if you're completely reliant on software, that would not be a, a good idea um, because the software should not generate the design for you. 
it should be uh, you generating your your kind of controlling certain aspects and then your it's almost like you're writing a formula. So if you use, um, you know, uh, coding software or, or uh, software like um, Grasshopper that sort of uh, is generative, it allows you to generate design or uh, allows you to parametrically tweak certain parameters within the design system uh, that you can always do by, you know, you write the rules and then you allow the software to sort of uh, or computationally you, you sort of tweak certain parameters and you can actually get a whole catalog of different outcomes rather than one single outcome for one single uh, problem. And then this can also be translated into physical or analog model models. So I think it's always uh, an understanding between the digital and, and the analog. I hope I was able to answer your question. Yes, yes. Thank yes, you so yes, much. Yes, thank you. I request all the participants to raise your hand if you have any questions, or you can also use your chat box to post your questions. Is there any other questions from the participants? Yes, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am, for being patient enough to answer all the questions. Now I request Meenakshi Prasad to deliver the OGA files. Please, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Sasi. Uh, it's indeed my privilege to offer this OGA of thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Takbir Fatima, architect, uh, for kindly remembering the first workshop that you did for us at Midas. Yeah, it was a great remembrance and um, your presentation was an um, insightful fractal geometry um, and uh, thanks for sharing your uh, process right from a small product to a bazaar to an installation along with the simulation studies on the thermal comfort properties and also the constraints, how you have uh, challenged the constraints to creativity. That example was really mind blowing. I think it would have benefited all our uh, students as well as the participants. And I also want to extend my generous thanks to our management, our director, madam, our principal and Midas faculties, our uh, HOD, MRC HOD, Professor Jairaman, and VR HOD, uh, Justin, uh, for arranging this webinar in a successful manner. And uh, also the admin team for uh, extending their network uh, connectivity, all the issues uh, that are sought out. And um, indeed, it's a privilege to have you with us, ma'am. Uh, Thanks once again, and I also thank our professors for their uh, inspiring uh, supervision at every point of time in college. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's it's an honor to be invited, and I'm really happy to be a part of this. and And I hope it's really uh, mainly that it's really useful for the students. Um, and thank you, uh, the whole team at Mira. So, I will ask all the people to switch on the camera. No? We will take one uh, screen shot. I request I'm the audience to please switch on the camera. On screen, on screen. Yeah. Just ask everyone to switch on. I request the audience to please switch on the camera for the photo session. Prasida, you have to take, okay? <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Once everyone sits down, you have to take, okay? You are able to see, no, in screen. How many people are you able to see? All MR students, please sit down in the video.
वन मिनट तस्वीरें का वन मिनट Okay. Uh, now uh, we can just screenshot it. Ready? Full screen or full? रेडी ससी रहेगा हेमा मैडम यू आर एबल टू सी द स्क्रीन हाँ या रेडी रेडी थैंक यू Thank you, Sasi. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. I request all the participants to kindly fill the feedback form. Thanks again for joining us today, and we will see you in all the next session soon in Midas. Thank, Thank, you Thank you so much. Thank you, Takbir. नीचे मेरा आप बंटर में आता है, घर रहते हैं नुती एम एम बजा वाले दूध की रोटी भी करेंगे। वही तो है ना निकला। थैंक यू तकबीर।